here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be moderator today. Welcome back to the big week for small business. This is our final day, which is exciting. And on behalf of our entire team putting together the event, thank you for being with us for this breakout session. We hope you're enjoying your time with us for all three of the days, or if you're just tuning in now, that's okay too. Here at the Chamber, we advocate for you on federal policies that impact you and your business. But you advocate for yourself in many different ways. And this year, many small business owners have found themselves in more of an advocacy role than ever before. They've advocated for themselves in various ways, from shaping policy to negotiating contracts to rallying their teams around their goals. We'll start with just uh, brief introductory remarks and a few questions from our speakers to, to kick off the conversation. And then we're gonna open this up for discussion with the whole group. Now, it can be a little bit awkward online, but hopefully we have some familiarity with the chat function. Um, and I'll go over some of the housekeeping before we begin. Now, the good news is I don't have to tell you where the bathrooms are, uh, but there is some technology that'll help the conversation flow. So if you haven't already, please mute phones, turn off your cameras using the toolbar on the screen. Now, once our panel is over, you could turn your camera back on. And especially if you have a question, I'm going to recognize you in the chat and ask whether or not you would like to ask the question yourself, or sometimes there's stuff going on in the background and in all of our lives now, and you'd prefer for me to ask the question, and that's okay too. Uh, if you want to contribute to an existing question or discussion, please raise your hand using the hand raise function on the toolbar. And if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, you can go old school, turn on your, your video and simply raise your hand. It will try and recognize you. So with that, uh, we introduce the three of our panelists uh, who are small business owners who will be sharing some insight with us today. We have Tiffany Hauser, the founder and CEO of Evolve. Hey, Tiffany. We have uh, Natalie Caddis, who's the CEO of Caddis Enterprises, and Joe Seamus, who's the co-founder and owner of Flags of Valor. Uh, and we have someone from the DC area with Tiffany. We have Salt Lake represented by Natalie, and Joe is here in the Virginia area as well. So Tiffany, let's start with you. And uh, after I ask the question, please use this as an opportunity to talk with us a little bit about uh, about yourself and, and your company. But as a professional co coach, you help business owners become more effective leaders and communicators. What's the biggest barrier your clients face when it comes to leadership? And specifically, what are some of those barriers related to the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in? Great. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone who's joining us here on the East Coast. <laughs> so my name is Tiffany Hauser and I am, as Tom mentioned, the CEO and co-founder of Evolve. And we are transformational leadership coaches, trainers, individuals and companies to break through and elevate anything around leadership, emotional intelligence, growth mindset, potential mindset, um, we specialize in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to answer your question, Tom, uh, the biggest barrier, there's actually four, <laughs> but the biggest one or the biggest two, I would say, um, when it comes to leadership is looking good. When people are, rather than being authentic, they choose to look good and try to please everyone. And you know, and, and especially in this year, we know that pleasing everyone is impossible. I mean, if the election hasn't shown us that, uh, I don't know what else will. And so looking good is, you know, in our eyes, it's, it's what robs us of our authenticity. And when, we, you know, this topic we're talking about today of self-advocacy, authenticity is the game changer here. 
It is the superpower to advocate, is to be authentic, know who you are, grounded in your vision, know what you stand for. What is your business about? Who do you serve? And so when we're in a space of looking good, we might be thinking that uh, we serve any client or we'll take any client, any customer. And that might be true. That might be a truth. Yet when we're in our leadership, we know exactly who we serve, exactly what our product and, and or service um, creates. And we know exactly the direction and vision um, of where we want to go with our company. And then the other one I just want to slide in there is playing it safe. We can't play it safe this year. And what I mean by that is not taking risks. And as leaders and a leadership quality is we get to take risks and not to be in a constant state of risk because that's not, that's not sustainable, but to know that uh, when there is a decision and, and in our conversation behind the scenes before we popped on, Joe, you actually mentioned this, was you gotta make decisions. There are decisions that we might've been you know, procrastinating on or overthinking. And this year was a year of making those decisions. And then what we stand for with our clients is looking at them afterwards, like debriefing them, what worked about that decision and what didn't work rather than staying in the, indec the indecisiveness of that. So those are the two key pieces that we support our clients with specifically this year. Well, thank you. Uh, and and I love the way that you describe you don't just say be authentic. You actually really just get into uh, the details of, of what that means. Joe, I'll, I'll switch to you a little bit um, and, and take advocacy in a little bit of a different direction. When COVID first hit and there and, and there was a brand new lending program uh, through SBA, you were a nationwide spokesperson for the importance of small businesses getting a bridge loan to bring their employees back. Um, certainly a couple of highlights to brag on you a little bit, you know, for you to, to take the White House press secretary podium and talk to the American people about the importance of this new program and then actually testify before Senate, this, the a Senate committee and explain to them what's working and what could w work better. Really, we're, we're two amazing opportunities to advocate, but you're really advocating every day. And, and I'd love to hear from you. We're talking about how to be a better advocate. Can you explain to the folks who have dialed in, how do you balance you know, the operational importance of what you do as a, CP, uh, as, as a CEO and then the broader community importance of, of uh, in, in Tiffany's words, being authentic to your beliefs and the free enterprise system. It's been a wild year, Tom. Uh, and I don't think there was anything that could have prepared me for the things you just mentioned. But I will say um, the authenticity that Tiffany mentioned is, I think, really key to this. You can't wait until there's a crisis to figure out what you believe in and so uh, or what you stand for. So the values that your company embodies um, are things that you need to live every day. And so many companies start with a product or a service they want to offer. And then someday after a certain period of success, they say, hey, you know what? We should do something philanthropic. We should get involved. Um, we believe that a for-profit company can, can solve societal problems. So when we started out, we started out with a philanthropic mission married up with product so that we could try, you know, a lot, most people know the Tom's model, we're not the Tom's model, but we had a very specific purpose, which was employing American veterans in a manufacturing environment to provide for the entire three dimensional um, life cycle of an American veteran from going to war, returning to home, and then returning to a workforce that they may not have known before. And so in doing that, we had to really articulate to ourselves in writing and, and vocally what we believe in. And so when crisis hit, uh, it wasn't a time for us to, to figure that out. We'd already figured that out. And so as far as advocacy, um, I, I can't say it enough that being involved in your community and serving others will, in fact, also serve your business. That's not why you should do it. You should do it because it's important and it's the right thing to do. But by doing it, um, you're living the values of yourself and you're living the values of your organization. And so when these things came about this year, and I'm talking about specifically the pandemic, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, the, the response from the federal government to support small business, um, it was a natural 
on ramp essentially because it was I was only vocalizing all the things that I think the small business community was enduring. I was fortunate to be selected for that, but there are so many people out there that are doing the same things that are living a virtuous business uh, cycle every day. Thank you, Joe. Natalie, uh, I, I do find it somewhat ironic that we have uh, two incredible business owners from the DC area. But I'm going to shift to you out in Salt Lake City to actually talk about congressional fly-ins and interaction with uh, leaders here in Washington, D.C. And, and specifically, uh, I'm, I'm referencing your work with the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. You were a leader uh, for their virtual fly in D.C. And I know you're also uh, very active with the Salt Lake Chamber and other organizations that have not missed a beat when it comes to interacting with Congress and federal officials, even though uh, it's a different world. You know, it's mm -hmm. Zoom meetings, it's Microsoft Teams meetings and, and so forth. And, and in explaining how you do that, could you really narrow in on your advice on how do you make the ask? You know, how do you narrow in on that all important ask regardless of if it's the president of the United States, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, Chairman Rubio, or Chairwoman Nidia Velasquez. That ask is critically important, but it can be awkward in, in person and maybe even more awkward virtually. So could you lead us through that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So yeah, I've had the opportunity to participate in the virtual fly-in where we led over 344 small businesses uh, had uh, virtual meetings with Congress members and senators. I also had the opportunity to meet with um, SBA uh, Administrator Car uh, Javita Carranza, which was really exciting. Um, I think the, the big ask is um, in how you're messaging. So we have similar messages. If your messages overlap and you understand what it is that they're trying to do, it, it makes it a little less daunting and a little less scary. Um, I think, you know, when I look at what we're trying to do as an organization, and we're a plastic manufacturer, our, uh, our products support the power utility industry. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to explain about our products. It's not a self-explanatory product. So there's a lot of education behind that. And when I look at the journey that we go through with our buyers of what they're going to do and why, why should I buy this product, the why behind it, you know, that's, I look at the ask through the similar lens. What's their why? Why are they doing this? And if there's overlap, it seems less scary. And it seems like it's not such a long shot. So those are some of the things that I look for when I make that ask. And, you know, I think shoot for the moon. And uh, if you miss, the land amongst the stars. That's one of my favorite quotes. I love it. Uh, you heard it right here from Natalie, the moonshot, <laughs> the, the small business moonshot. Why not? Um, yeah. I will pause for just a second to encourage the folks who have dialed in, think about questions they would like to ask the panelists and please post them in the chat. Uh, and then Tiffany, I'll, I'll start with you again and just ask a little bit about when you're coaching, I, I think there's, there's to be authentic covers so many different areas and you really drilled into its importance. But when it comes to advocating, okay, what, how, how do you advise some of your clients on being authentic, but not being kind of the icky, pushy salesperson? Like, what's the balance that you advise your clients to navigate on that? Great question, Tom. So one, the biggest piece is that vision piece and knowing who you are. So who you are as the business owner, and then who your what and who your company is. What's the vision? What's that destination that you're going for? What is the big picture that we're up to? And really, the, the other piece is what action steps does it take to get there? Because what happens is we focus on, you know, when we're not in this space of advocating, we're focusing on what should we do? What should we do? Rather than who am I? What, what do I stand for? What is this? So when we actually coach individuals, whether it is the entrepreneur or the leader within the company, or we coach companies, um, you know, on a, on a collective, we create the space for them to understand who they are and connect with uh, the company's vision. And if there is a misalignment there, 
we coach them through that. What, what's, what's different here? What, what doesn't align with who you are or, or the way you're operating as a business? What, what's, what's out of alignment here? And then we also create and ground companies and individuals into that vision, into the beacon. Like what is that, that end game that we're looking for? And that's what really differentiates our work because we focus on emotional intelligence and the growth mindset. Because if, if you're standing in a fixed mindset, and a lot of people were standing in that place this year as individuals and as you know professionals, we, a lot of people were standing in, this is the way it is, or I am the way I am, or they are the way they are. And that's the fixed mindset. That's not using your gifts, your talents, your skills, the, the amount of people that work with you to actually cause and create a different outcome. So if we're standing in a place of fixed mindset, well, that's just the, you know, the pandemic is here and there's nothing I can do. We're not really advocating anything. We're stuck right out the gate. So it's standing in that, taking a little risk, not a huge risk, a little risk to step outside the comfort zone and now start looking because each and every one of us are a different person than we were pre-March 2020, I guarantee in some way, shape or form. And so it's a matter of creating the space for them to see and do the work because most of us are not doing that work. We wanna get into action strategy. What what do we do, what do we do? Rather than standing in a place of who am I and what do I stand for? So we create and hold space for that. Thank you. Joe, I'm gonna shift to you for a question about teams and teams and advocacy. Um, The craftsman you employ at Flags of Valor are incredible human beings, and they're showing part of who they are through these beautifully crafted American flags. Uh, That in itself is advocacy, but they're individuals, and they see you and Brian and others kind of out front and, and carrying the brand. There's obviously a need for them to be part of what Flags of Valor stands for. How do you enroll the the team within Flags of Valor to the broader advocacy strategy? I love what Tiffany said about who am I and what do I stand for? And I think that organizationally that has to be shared across the, the culture. It has to become something that's innate in the people that work inside your walls. Because it's not just Brian and I, every single person that wears our uniform of our company is essentially an advocate or a salesman or representative of our team. And so they have to embody the same values that we do. Um, and so I'm a big believer, and I can't remember who first coined this, but to win your first thousand customers, if you can win a thousand people that truly love your brand, you're going to be fine. And, and what I've found is if your entire culture embodies the same values and they're going out there in the world and they're interacting with their families and friends and their neighborhood and community and they're living the same values, you end up with an advocacy army. And, and what we've also found was that it's not just, um, you know, there's, there's overt selling, there's overt advocating. It's, it's I, I want you to support us for these five reasons and you should do this. The other side that we've done really well was not being over and being generous. The more generous we were, uh, even when, long before we were making any money, by being generous, we were winning people to our mission. And then they were the ones that were for us. And so the best advocate is, is someone that believes in you, that can sell you uh, even better than you can sell yourself. And so that has been um, a big game changer for us. Uh, it's really helped us. Thank you. And Natalie, I'm going to shift the topic a little bit um, because I, I noticed your head was nodding uh, yeah. in, in, when Joe was talking about kind of team and advocacy. I'm going to shift a little bit about um, unintended advocacy. Uh, you and I have spoken in the past about um, how you've had to try to pivot from a sales perspective and that you used, you used to really put a lot of emphasis on the face to face with sales reps who really need to understand the products that you make in order to sell them effectively. Well, you can't really do that as much anymore. The trade shows isn't, you know, that that those those don't happen uh, these days. And so you came up with an idea of capturing that informational session through video. And then uh, you've 
told me the story about how that broadened to have kind of an advocacy component to it. Could you could you lead the folks who dialed in through the journey that we've talked about? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, and I just want to make a comment about what Joe said is, you know, that it's that generosity and that integrity, I think, that really one of the things that we've focused on. So as we've pivoted through our sales process and our sales cycle, um, yeah, we did a lot of face to face uh, meetings. We'd meet with engineers in the utility space. Um, We really stopped and took some time to understand what is the journey that that buyer goes through. And, you know, when you make a decision, regardless as to what you're buying, you make, you know, you, you become aware of a product and you make these decisions, maybe, un, you know, unconscious decisions about why you buy something. So we took some time to understand that journey that that buyer goes through. And for us and our products, there's some education that has to happen. We developed a webinar series based on the um, why our products are impactful. And again, we didn't focus on our products at all. We focused on other information that we can share with them to provide value. We are very um, intentional in trying to move from being a vendor to somebody to being a partner. Because I believe if you invest in your ecosystem to try to make it better, they're gonna remember you and they're gonna think of you when they are in that position to buy. Um, And so, you know, we. All of our webinar series are not about our product. There's no feature benefits. It's not form fit function. It's uh, bigger things like um, industry regulations. It's safety and sustainability of the national grid. Those are the things that we're talking about and why we can have an impact to that. Again, we don't talk about our products. We're just trying to invest in the professional development of our sales representatives who are all over the world. And they're in the they're meeting with uh, linemen and foremen and uh, engineers all over the world. So again, they're growing their professionalism and they're going to share that information moving forward. So I've been impressed with the outcomes that we've seen. We've only done a couple. We've done one and we were in the process of doing a second one. But when we are looking at how do we develop this, um, we are getting really positive feedback of what else they want to hear. So we can be that partner instead of just a vendor because we want to provide more value. We want to be invested in their growth as they're invested in ours. Thank you, uh, Joe. I'm going to ask you a tough question. You know, that we're now that we're all warmed up, we can get into the ugliness of of things. Um, I get the sense that when when we when we embrace the authenticity and mission, you rise above what some folks don't like about a highly competitive area. So I'm I'm kind of pre-guessing your answer to my question. But sometimes in a competition, it's really very simple. There is a winner and then there is someone who loses. And you are in uh, you are in a business that has that that it has competitors. Have you found that your advocacy, your mission based advocacy allows you to go to rise above some of the uh, unpleasantness of the winners and losers in a competitive environment? Uh, Yeah, I think so. I think it's a great question, Tom. And yes, we are in a very competitive environment and every business is, at least uh, if they're not now, they will be in a very competitive environment. Um, But going to what Tiffany said in her open, we are being directly copied by a number of other trying to mimic, you know, our success. Um, that is happening, and that's not new. That happens all the time, especially when you start something that people admire. But what is different between us and all of them is authenticity. Uh, you can make many claims, but it's different to actually back those claims up. And so, and that's true, I think, in every market that's out there. Um, and so in our case, you know, we set out to employ veterans, for example. We've employed over 70 in, in just under five years to deliver over 100,000 hours of American manufacturing labor starting at zero, you know, in that period of time is one of our most proud metrics. And so it, raising over a million dollars for veteran charities in that time. So when we talk about authenticity, to, to actually mean what you say and live it, that's the best thing I think anyone can do for their brand is to be authentic, know what you stand for, know what you believe in, and then go out and live it every day. And it goes beyond your product. It goes beyond your service. It becomes innate to who you are, and it's how the world sees you. So they don't see you as Tom Sullivan. They see you as Tom Sullivan, who means all of these things and stands for those things, as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. 
It's it's one. It's hand and glove. And so I don't um, I don't have any hard feelings about competition. Competition makes us better. But ultimately, it will separate the wheat from the chaff. And so you need to know which side of that you're going to land on. Thank you, Joe. And uh, Tiffany, shifting to you, we've got we've got a question that has come in uh, from the participants. Abby, would you like to actually ask it yourself, or would you like for me to ask it? Okay, I can. Okay, I can. I can. Ooh, little little bit of reverb there. Um, I'll go ahead. So I'll go ahead and ask it. Uh, Abby asks, what has been the biggest learning curve uh, moment for you as a business owner during the crisis? And actually, I'm going to add to Abby's question a little bit. So not only what has been the biggest learning curve for you, Tiffany, but what about your biggest learning curve for one of your clients during the pandemic? Wow, this is such a great question. Thank you, Abby. Uh, for me personally, it was my biggest learning curve was understanding how much support we do have as a company and how much support there is out there. Uh, we, you know, we got to get really creative this year uh, because the moment the pandemic hit, our calendar was kind of like a lot of white space. And, you know, because of who we are and what we stand for, we knew this was not a long term thing. We knew this was momentary. And yet, you know, I'm a human being. Of course, I, you know, there's a little bit of fear, a little bit of, you know, uncertainty. And so for me, it was trust and understanding that there is support. And we, I got very, very creative with doing joint up with companies that complement who we are and what we do. And man, has that been fun. And our business now is exploding. It's, it's interesting. Now we're like, shoot, where's that white space? <laughs> and then on, on a client, on a client um, aspect, um, this year has been really understanding who works, who do we work with? So understanding our people, understanding our culture, so many things have been thrown at us as individuals and as uh, as a collective this year that, you know, starting just with like pandemic, then remote working, then the civil rights uprising, then mass, then election. It's like, whoa. So really understanding who we are is that big thing that I keep talking about. But who are we working with? Who we are collectively as a team? So a lot of companies who have the resources have been looking at, you know, developing and breaking through the culture, any toxic culture issues, and really starting to understand who we all are as a collective and making sure everyone feels included and able to fully express who they are as well. Because one of the, one of the areas we saw that was a new area of exclusion this year was the working parent. Oh yeah. And the working parent, and not because the, the, company excluded them, but it became an internal ex excluder. Shoot, what am I going to do now? I have my, my kids and I'm working, I'm on a screen, they're running in and out of the room. So they were making up stories like, I don't fit in or this isn't going to work. So it was like a, a, a way, another thing that we're adding to the pot of inclusion. So that was one of the biggest things this year that I've seen so far with our clients. Thank you. Actually, uh, I, I, I can't see all of the participants, but I sensed there was a ton of head nodding yeah. as soon as you got into the 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 family dynamic of that that many of us are going through. Uh, you, you, Tom, Tom uh, Abby also asked, "How do we how do we handle that?" So oh, yeah. some of the companies that hired us, we have been hosting town halls for them, so facilitating. Uh, collective conversations around all of the topics and issues that are um, affecting their culture. So town halls there, and um, yeah, that's been a big one for us. Well, thank you. You mentioned one thing in your narrative about fear, and Natalie, you because you are a supplier to um, utility companies to make sure that electricity is still on at critical facilities like hospitals. Um, 
you had to have experienced some fear from employees about going back to work. And, uh, you know, when we say new normal, there's really nothing normal about anything that's new. And certainly in these days, uh, nothing is, is normal about it. But how did you how did you put your employees at ease when fear was just hitting them in the face from everything they read, everything that they talk about socially distanced at, from their neighbors uh, when they go home at night? How, how did you handle that? Yeah, that was a challenge for us in the early, um, very early. So we were deemed part of critical infrastructure, which I was extremely grateful for and um, thought everybody else would be really grateful for that too. But as things were closing down, what I learned was there were a lot of my staff who were like, wait, you're putting me at risk. And so we had to really kind of identify that and, and, and show up for them and understand what their concerns were. Um, so some of the things that we did was, I mean, obviously we put into place some of the restriction, uh, the cleaning uh, regiments that others have put into place, mask requirements. We redeveloped work cells so that we can create additional space. But I think one of the most important things we did was really listen to them and try to understand what their fears were so we could address them. And, and, and Tiffany made a really good comment early on that, you know, don't play it safe. We had to address it. And I had to get in front of them in a town hall and say, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And it's, it's okay. We're going to work through this together. So we started with town hall meetings twice a week. And as things started to calm down, we, we moved to once a week. But I also um, kind of rose my hand and said, hey, I want to participate in the governor's economic um, COVID task force so that I heard firsthand what the governor was saying and what the community was doing and some and best practices from other manufacturers in the area. So that, I think, gave them some confidence that we were trying to understand, we were trying to uh, learn what was happening and put those best practices in place for our team as well. But the fear of COVID, I think, was, especially in the earlier days, was bigger than I anticipated. Um, you know, because we can clean the surface, that's one thing, but how do you help them become less fearful? And that was, um, you know, communicating with them and how do we build that camaraderie? And the other thing we did and to Joe's comment is, you know, we focused on what our core values were. And our core value is integrity and respect in a collaborative community. So how are we gonna show up for each other to be able to do that? And I think that that helps us through some of those early days as well. Thank you, Natalie. Joe, uh, Tiffany talked about uh, filling the white space with partnerships and I've come to appreciate the loyalty that Flags of Valor has in some of your vendor relationships. I mean, I remember um, talking with you about DeWalt. Or I've heard your relationship with Under Armour. Um, can you give, Joe, can you give some advice? And then, Tiffany, I'm going to ask if you can add to Joe's advice. Give some advice to people who have dialed in about how do you start? You know, you've got a great company going. You've got a great mission going. But how, how do you reach out to the DeWalt and say, you're going to be our long-term partner. You, we want you to be here. Our craftsmen like your tools, and we want to be your partner because our, our missions um, are swimming in the same direction. How, how do you, what advice do you have for folks that are at that point? They want to fill the white space, but they're kind of paralyzed by not really knowing what to do. That's a good one, Tom. I, I don't think there's a perfect script on how to manage that. Um, but I'll tell you what we did. Uh, part of it was cold calling. Brian uh, sent an email just cold to DeWalt and it got answered by their chief of marketing. And that's not something you normally expect to see. Uh, that happened. Uh, at the same time, there's different types of currency. There's financial currency, and dollars. There's time currency and, and just giving me time. And then there's idea currency. All of those things matter. And so when you're asking for help, uh, sometimes it's, hey, I need business. I need to fill white space. I got to keep my shop going. Nobody wants a quiet shop. That's the worst thing you could have in an organization uh, that does manufacturing. So sometimes that's what you're looking for. Sometimes you need help because you need somebody to, to spend some time listening to you to help you figure out where you're at. Sometimes you need somebody to say, hey, Tom, you are off base. 
turn left. You've got to figure this out because you're going to you're going to end. It's not going to go well. And so when you're looking for help and you're asking to build those partnerships, um, some of them were built naturally just by working in the same arenas and, and being a part of the same missions. Shared purpose is a really powerful thing. Uh, and some of them were created because we had alignment and products and we could do co-marketing. And some of them came because it was just good introductions. It goes back to the my army of advocates is more powerful than I am. And so having a group of people that advocate for you and are willing to make those introductions is way more meaningful because now you're coming in warm. I don't have to put you on your heels because I'm cold calling you and no one wants to be sold to. It's different when I'm offering you something. I want to help you. I want to understand your problems so I can make your organization better. And so, you know, a, a simple example for us that's very specific. Almost every company in the, in the United States buys some kind of employee recognition program awards, annual gifts to their families, to their employees, their staff, whatever it is. If you look at that stuff, most of it is not very emotional. Most of it's somewhat anonymous and most of it's not made in the United States. I'm a big advocate, obviously, of American manufacturing. So when you start talking about things that people are already doing and you offer them a better solution that can provide a more meaningful engagement with their employee or their client, and you can show them how it affects their local community and the economy, everyone's winning. And so it, you go back to shared values, shared purpose, um, and then you balance. Cold calling is not a very popular thing. Nobody wants to do that. Um, it's marginally successful. With that comes all the other introductions, the hot introductions, where you have an advocate that believes in you and wants to take you to the next level. And that's um, in the balance there is where you'll find success. Tiffany, I, I love that. I love Joe's expression, the hot connection. Uh, <laughs> could you add, I mean, you, you advise clients about this every day. Could you add to some of Joe's comments? Yeah, I agree with everything Joe said. I mean, that's that was one of our strategies was cold calling. I mean, we didn't actually pick up the phone. We didn't dial <laughs> dial anything, but it was on LinkedIn. You know, as we came across work, research, data, um, anything that spoke to us, we reached out to the author or the creator or the, the person who, um, you know, sourced that piece of work and Here's what I want to add to it. You are not the only business that has had a pandemic happen to you. Every business has had a pandemic happen to them. We're all looking for something else to diversify what we're up to, to collaborate, to expand, to create abundance in our business. So my addition to that would be to let go of looking good, because that's really the reason we know people don't want to cold call rejection they, they feel it's a sale and when you let go of that and you stand in again who you are and what you stand for and the purpose so jo joe i really like that and natalie you hit on that too the purpose of why i'm reaching out and joe i want to piggyback on that when you come from a place of generosity i'm not here just to get something from you i'm also here to support you and and be generous with how can I support you as well? So create a, like a cyclical approach to that. Not about what can I just get, but what also can I give and be in contribution and in service to with your company as well? And that's when you really know you have that win-win formula. And that's exactly what has happened to our company, Evolve, is we reach out to the, work, the, the people who are creating work that's similar to ours or complementary. We just a simple LinkedIn message. We really love this. You know, this this will support X, Y, and Z. Here's what we have to add to your pot. We'd love to talk to you. And I'm talking about, the, they call us the same day. This isn't like weeks go by. In the beginning, they were calling us the same, like 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is you? Whereas almost like, a fangirl situation in some of the cases. I'm like, did the owner of this company just call us like immediately? So a couple of points I threw out there, but the biggest point is we're all in this situation. So don't think that, you know, and just like Natalie said, Moon, take this opportunity to big opportunities, the big partnerships that are out there and waiting for you. You know, and, and I love how, Joe, you broke it down into dollars, ideas, and time. There's so, we're all 
here to support one another. That's what's so great about being small business owners is we know we can't do it alone. But, Tiffany, you said something there about describing how you interact with people that you may not know. And I think that's critically important. You're trying to drive a meaningful connection. You're, you're offering them feedback on something they're doing or you're offering them help. Uh, you're not saying, hey, I'm Tiffany, let's connect. And then the next message is, I want to sell you this. Yeah, no. Most everybody that contacts me is trying to sell me something within 30 seconds and it doesn't work. It's the worst thing ever. I hate it. In fact, if I could put a disclaimer online that said, do not contact me if you're selling me something, I would do it. Um, but it's completely different when you're offering them something and trying to understand who they are. And that is authentic. It's genuine. I want to know you, uh, not in a weird way, but in a way like, hey, I need to understand you so I understand your problems so I can help you. Because uh, I might have services that can help you and make you better. Um, and it's it's really hard to differentiate right now when everyone's taking the same approach. So it's refreshing when someone actually strives a meaningful connection, doesn't delete, delete Tom Sullivan, insert Joe Seamus, send, delete Joe Seamus, insert, you know, next person, send. It doesn't work. It, it kills me. So. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And that that's what we call building relationships. So it's not about going for the sale. That's the desperate approach. When you're not connected to your vision, you, you're just like, there's no hope. You're in that fixed mindset. So when you're in your vision, when you're taking a stand, you build relationships first. And you understand that it's about all of us, not just what can I get out of this? And really, that's like the, the old school um, comprehensive. I, I used, I'm a former <laughs> sales BD uh, professional, and it was comprehensive. We never talked about what we were saying. We wanted to know who you were first and mm -hmm. to see if it's a fit. So, yeah. And then the whole generosity piece, that's 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 a big one. How can so, I support you? How can I help you? And so mm -hmm. Tiffany and, and Joe, a lot of what we're talking about may seem as though we're talking about different sales strategies. Uh, but in fact, there is a parallel to advocacy. The idea that you are recognizing who, what your audience needs and wants from listening and creating win-win situations. And Natalie, uh, I, I can't help but think pre-pandemic, you having um, a beautiful bird with you at trade shows. Right. Um, and, and so your partnership with an Audubon society, for instance, is a perfect example of what we've been talking about, but in an advocacy context. Can you lead the participants through a little bit about what the heck I'm talking about? We have a, a manufacturer who has wild birds with her selling a plastic product at a trade show. Uh, try to actually make some sense out of my question to you. Yeah, happy to. So, um, you know, pre-pandemic, we there were big international trade shows. And we're as a small organization, you know, our um, we're in this big hall next to Siemens and next to some really big manufacturers. Um, so our products go over the top of power structures to prevent animals from causing power outages. And a lot of times, those power outages are caused by large birds of prey. So eagles, they'll stand, they'll perch on a power line on a pole, and when they go to take off, their wingspan is over six feet. So they will go face to face or face to ground. They'll cause a power outage. Our products insulate from that. So as we're looking at this great big hall and, and you know, the question, the conversation around the office was, well, what do we do? We, you know, buy water bottles or what do we do? I said, no, let's not do any of that. Let's find a rehab facility. Um, you know, the Nature Conservancy or the Peregrine Fund or, you know, there are bird uh, rehabs all over the United States. Let's partner with them. Let's make them a donation and they'll bring an education ambassadors to the facility. So when you're walking through a very large trade show and it's busy and somebody will say, well, that's a bald eagle. That's pretty cool. And guess what they're doing? They're taking pictures. They're sending it to their kids. They're FaceTiming them going, look, there's a bald eagle right here and I'm right next to it. They think that that's pretty cool. And that's so much more meaningful than a water bottle or something, you know, Joe made the comment of, you know, how do you engage with your employees? Well, how do you engage with your customers? How do you make it meaningful for them? And again, I, I know um, one of the stories 
because this is a show that happened a couple of years now, and we've had different birds and eagles, uh, owls, et cetera. One of the um, big foremen, he came to me and he said, hey, I saw you last year. I don't even know what you sell, but look, here's the picture of the owl that you had last year as my home screen. And there's the owl and our logo behind it. That's some advocacy. That's some soft selling is, you know, uh, will he ever be a customer? I don't care. He remembers us. And uh, that's what's more important is creating that lasting impression um, and that uh, generosity of, you know what, we made a pretty meaningful moment right there. Yeah, Natalie, it, it not only is it applicable to trade shows and, and branding, but from when it comes to legislative advocacy, when you are advocating before a state or region or in Washington, D.C., and you're talking about the need for um, electricity infrastructure, the idea that you can partner with a group of, um, of, of naturalists uh, to impress upon policymakers the importance of electricity uh, infrastructure, you have actually taken the sales component that Tiffany and Joe talked about and, and created a win-win situation that sure, it's, it's really um, notable from a trade show perspective. It's also notable from an advocacy perspective because you're joining together with a coalition uh, that is purpose-driven. I mean, we've talked a lot in this panel about about purpose. Uh, I'd like to get to some participants who asked questions. Uh, a gentleman, Abir, uh, is asking a question. And Abir, if you could unmute yourself and show show if you'd like your your video, please ask the panelists a question. And then, Mr. McCoy, if you had a question, I'll come to you right after Abir. Okay, Abir might have dialed off and that's okay. We can still ask the question. He's asking the panel how to, how to connect my needs towards the risks and stakes caused by COVID. He's the founder of a consulting company. So as a beginner, uh, what advice do you have for me? I'll jump in and then Tiffany, if you wanna back clean up on this. Um, I would just say that this goes back to understanding the needs of the client first, uh, putting yourself in the client's shoes. I don't know what type of consulting you're talking about specifically. So without knowing that, I have to be fairly general. Um, but whatever your field of consulting is, if you can focus your, your communication and your offering essentially of, of support, of aid, of counsel, of your professional expertise towards that client, understanding that client uh, and what they're facing, even with what you you may not know all of their problems, but you're going to be able to, to do some of them um, based on your research. Uh, so understanding their needs and making offers um, of support, not asking things, but offering things first, I think is always a good a good event, um, a good starting point. Uh, Tiffany got bumped out and Erin is going to be working with Tiffany to get her back onto the platform. Uh, in the meantime, Mr. McCoy, do you have a question for the panel? Mr. McCoy, do you have a question for the panel? I don't, but the gentleman that just answered the question about consultants, that applies to where my head is at this moment, and that was a great point. And so um, for me, I think it is best to address the, the needs of the person. You, you don't present yourself as a I'll solve everything kind of consultant. Because that's not nobody can do that. But if you if you focus on what you can solve and then seek outside help on what you can't solve individual as an individual, I think then the client has a better respect for you. That's the lesson that I've learned over time. Um, so don't be don't be afraid to ask for help. So that's important. So for me right now, I'm consulting small business owners. And one of the things I had to take myself up, I had to kind of bring myself back in when I first started this a few years ago was because I wanted to fix all of their problems. Mm. And I lost hair doing that, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I realized you're not going to fix the world's problems with this one uh, entrepreneur, but work work on what you can, what you can solve and, and show them 
options or alternatives to whatever their their problems are. And a lot of times, what in the end of that, what I learned was that it's best to I kind of I lean to this quote. This is a quote that I use. A, a good teacher doesn't give you the answers. They tell you where to look. And I go with that, and, and that's worked great for me. That was it. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Tiffany, could you could you talk a little bit about counseling your clients on not being the Swiss Army knife, but focusing in on who they are and what they believe in? Because it's got to come up in, in your business. How, how do you counsel clients on narrowing in uh, on what you can do and not am being I, afraid of I asking for here? help? Yeah, you are. You sound great. So, Tom, um, I heard the beginning of your question, and I actually heard um, Michael's um, quote. And can you guys hear me? Am I? Yeah. Okay, great. great. Yeah. And I, I wanted to share, uh, Michael, that's also uh, <laughs> our philosophy in coaching is we never tell you anything. We create a space to evoke the answer from you. So we believe that you have all your answers because you are the, the creator, the designer, the author of your life, of your business, whatever that is. So we're very different than consultants. We, in fact, we don't know, we will let you know up front, we know nothing about anything. But what we're magical and masterful at is creating a space for you to find those answers and those solutions for yourself, for your team, for your company. And so Tom, um, the Swiss Army knife, we don't come across that that often with the kind of companies we work with. Uh, they're super focused. And our work is more on the people experience and culture. So we do kind of find that there when companies are trying to tackle the diversity uh, issues is that they kind of think it's one thing and they haven't grounded themselves into it. I feel very, that is my theatrical <laughs> side there. And so, you know, and I mentioned this in the, at the top of our session that when we're, when we're in an experience of looking good, when we want to look good and please everyone, we're, we're not focused in. And, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs, you know this term, niche. What is your niche? What is your focus? What do you specialize in? That's, that's all it is. And if you start experiencing the Swiss Army knife experience, then you're, again, you're not grounded in your vision you're not in your, your space of who you are and who you serve. And you, there might be a moment you get to check in with yourself. Check in and say, what my I think we lost her again. Uh oh, um, sorry, Tiffany, we, we lost you on that. Aaron will work to get you back in, but uh, Natalie, uh, Tiffany had just mentioned the check-in, and I, I, I know that she had referenced checking to make sure that you're on track for your purpose. But right. we also know that checking in is broader than that. It's it's a team component. Can you talk with us a little bit about you? You said that you're having regular town I halls. Pulling up. What might? Um, Natalie, you said that you're having regular town halls. How do you take some of that check-in component and have it actually parallel what Tiffany was talking about? And that is making sure that you're staying on track for what your niche is. It's a good question. So yeah, in our town halls, you know, that's my weekly check-in with the team to, to find out what is it that's concerning to them and what, um, you know, some of the things that we're facing as an organization right now is we've got a lot of business. Um, and we, we, you know, we need to keep people safe. We need to get product out the door. We have time deadlines and schedules that we're trying to meet. So, you know, I think one of the things that I focus on in our town hall meetings are here's what the organization is facing. What are you facing? How do we come together and how do we try to support each other through that? Um, those are kind of my check ins. But I, the comment of don't be the Swiss Army knife is interesting because it's easy to get yourself off track and it's easy to say, oh, look, here's this shiny thing over here. So I, I have to check in with myself, too, because as a plastic manufacturer, you know, when COVID started, we were inundated with can you make face shields? Can you make dividers? 
And I had to turn things away, not because I don't want to help people, but I didn't have the capacity and the bandwidth and the expertise. They, we had to kind of point them in different directions. So, you know, we couldn't be the Swiss Army knife, and nor do I want to be. You know, here's what we're good at, and we have to stay in our lane. Um, but that's easier said than done, too, because sometimes you get out of your lane and you don't realize you're out of your lane until, oh, wait, I got to I gotta write myself here. So those are some of the check-ins that I'm doing. Does that answer your question, Tom? It, it perfectly. And Joe, I'm, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Can you tell us a little bit about you? And we're all building off of Tiffany's comments where she's really stressed the kind of checking in for yourself. But then Natalie broadened that a little bit to a, ch a check in a little bit more broadly uh, with, with the team. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've integrated that into the operations at, at Flags of Valor? Uh, sure. And it's a balancing act. We were talking about advocacy uh, before, and that's one of the main themes today. And then, you know, relating that to not being a Swiss Army knife, I think is, is rather important. But there's a balance here because there's one approach, which is I'm going to listen to my client. And I'm going to follow the feedback from my clients, which could, in theory, lead you into a business that you never set out to be in in the first place. And then there's the other side. And this, and neither one of these, I think, is right or wrong, depending on what industry you're in. The other side is staying true to who you are, staying true to what your business is, and understanding what it looks like today, next year, and years down the road, so you can be durable. Because let's be honest, the business graveyard is full of businesses that didn't understand the path, right? And so, Natalie, what you're talking about when you're getting contacted by all of these people that want you to produce things you have to make a decision. I mean, maybe you could have gone down that road. And if you had done that, where would your business be in 2021 in a post pandemic world, right? And that's what we're all hoping for. And so right. I think about this um, as you're advocating and you're fighting for, for your peace, um, make sure you understand what you value, what your, what your strategic, um, your, your competitive advantage is, uh, what your product is, Always listen to the client would be a recommendation, but don't allow the client to drive your ship. You have to be the commodore of your warship. And so continue to, to steer the best way that makes sense based on what you set out for, while also listening to all the signals that are out there. And, and I'll go back one last time, build an army of advocates because they will be exponentially more impactful than any one of us can ever be. Joe, thank you. Tiffany, thank you. Natalie, thank you. Uh, Michael, I see your, your face, so thank you as well. Thank you to all the participants who dialed in this afternoon. Now, this does reach the end of this breakout. You have just enough time to either grab a late breakfast, grab a lunch, uh, and then come back and join us for the premier part of this week, and that is the Dream Big Awards. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And thank you most of all for joining us during our big week for small business. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.